that I started thinking, well, what, how can I explain it to people that something that's novel doesn't necessarily mean it's criminal. Hey, investors, Bradley here from Watson Estates, and you're listening to the largest, fastest growing podcast for Toronto real estate on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. As a broker and investor, I like to keep up to date with what's going on in the news, and we track that for you. But along the way, we want to talk to large investors and folks that can do what we talk about today. John Pierre Laporte on our show, CEO of Integris Pension Management Corp, share with us an amazing advanced technique, a golden egg for you to apply to your real estate portfolio to pay zero taxes in income tax, the income that's generated from that property, zero tax, and the equity gains from that property, zero tax. That's right. This is a real thing, guys. Jean-Pierre has been able to take his years and years of practicing pension law and has been able to link it to small investors just like you. Through pension plans, we have amazing opportunities of, ahead of us. When he reached out to us to join us on the show, we said, yes, yes, a resounding yes. Come on and share this insight before the rest of the real estate community finds out this is your opportunity to get first dibs and understanding and to learn an uh, advanced technique that's overall really, really cool. So we're excited to have John Pierre on the show. When you love this episode, hit the like and leave us a comment. But before we get started here, if you've been enjoying our content, please subscribe enjoy the show. John Pierre, thanks for joining us on the show. How are you doing? Oh, good, good. Snowed in, but uh, happy to be here. Yes, we're recording this. We're catching up right now on our, our guest interviews. So this one's going to be going out quicker rather than some of the other ones, which we had, you know, with the season, the holiday season backed up about a month. But this will be timely. This will be a, a really good introduction, a really good start to the new year and open the minds of a lot of our listeners. I'm really anxious to get into some of these questions with you. But before we do, Please uh, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your, your backstory here, and then we'll, we'll jump into some very valuable content. All right. Well, thanks. So I'm a, I'm a pension lawyer by training. I've been practicing pension law for about 20 years, and I used to work on Bay Street with some of the big farms that you may, you may have heard of, like Osler's and Bennett Jones. And I was a specialist in the area of pensions and benefits. So not very sexy, but I realized about 10 years ago that um, unfortunately, a lot of people in the small private sector, people that have their own companies, entrepreneurs, were not being provided with any real pension solution. So I started researching this area and discovered a few tools out there. And, and about 10 years ago, decided to start uh, Integris Pension Management Corporation to provide uh, real uh, gold-plated pension plans to small business owners across the country. So that's kind of a, in a nutshell, the, the backstory. To, to set the, the, the framework for the show and to kind of recognize, I think, the goal that, um, that Jean-Pierre stumbled across folks, when we, when we talked about the Smith's Maneuver, we did this a, a few weeks ago, and many people have heard of the Smith's Maneuver, but the same shock that people get when they listen to the Smith's Maneuver is very similar to this, where it's like, how does this, how did we not already know this? This is available to so many people. It seems like a relatively simple tool. Obviously, it has its complexities as the Smith Maneuver does too. But that's what I'm excited about today. It's going to be a brand new idea, a new concept for many of our investors, specifically those that um, are incorporated. And for realtors, that might seem like a pipe dream, but obviously we've just had new laws that allow realtors to incorporate. So maybe we can start there for people who have the real estate license, which is everyone and their uncle these days anyways. And we can build out a framework of using pension plans to, to uh, shock our audience here. So I guess why should a realtor with this in mind incorporate their real estate business? Well, I'm talking here of realtors that are making good money. Obviously, if you only sell one or two properties a year, it may not be worth the bother. But if you are really in this space and you're making a lot, you're making decent money. I have a good friend of mine who's a, who's a realtor. He's, I think he told me he pulled in about $1.5 million of commission. So he's, he's doing okay. Uh, so if you're in that, you don't have to be in that category, but I'm just saying if you're making decent money uh, and I would say that that's about let's say $150,000 to $200,000 and up in commissions. Now you really need to think about incorporating because if you're not incorporated uh, and you're taking all this income personally, 
you know that the marginal tax rate in Ontario is 53.5%. So more than half of your commissions are going to the government. If you instead incorporated, because the commissions are paid to your professional corporation, the income tax bite, instead of being 53.5%, drops to 12.2% on the first 500,000. And then on the next, well, after that, it's 26.5%. Well, that's still half of what you're paying personally. And so long as you're not pulling the money out of your corporation, that money can continue to grow. And depending on what you do with it, it may or may not be taxed right away. Yeah. So that's that's reason number one. I mean, there's also li some liability protection, but and other employer benefits that you can tack on. But that's that's the big reason. The other massive reason is that if you don't have a professional corporation, you can't set up a personal pension plan. And you're missing out on about 20 advantages that people with an RRSP don't get because they're in the wrong product. They're in an RRSP when they really should be in a, in a pension plan. So that's the other reason. Okay. So here we go, guys. This is the, the launch pad. So we've got this professional corporation set up. Um, right now, the average Canadian is obviously using RRSPs as that vehicle to pull money back and to use to invest. And it seems to be the, the product sold by major banks, but why do personal uh, pension plans provide more tax relief than an RSP? This, this idea that RSP is kind of the golden child. What makes a pension plan better? Yeah, it's purely a matter of, it's, it's because of legislative changes and the, the legislation that governs pension plans is completely different from the one that governs RSPs. So you have to understand RSPs came in 1957 and they offer you one single tax deduction a year, your annual contribution. With a pension plan, we're relying on different provisions of the Income Tax Act. And under those provisions, we have seven additional tax deductions beyond the annual contribution. And some of these are huge and dwarf the annual contribution. So if you were to compare on a graph, the amount of money that you're allowed to contribute and therefore write off, uh, on in a PPP versus an RSP, the two, the, and imagining that imagining that the two growth curves grow at the same speed, so we have the same rate of return. There's a huge difference, a huge gap that develops between the two growth curves over time, and that's just because we're allowed to put more money because the law allows us to put more money. Yeah, now I can walk you through all those advantages, but I, the the big picture is the law is what allows us to do this. Yeah, I mean, when, when you come across, um, when the average person comes across concepts like we're going to talk about, I think uh, it, the, the quick response is, well, what am I doing that's illegal? It seems like a very out of, out of step move and maneuver. But um, I mean, we're talking to a lawyer here and we're talking along the lines of um, the laws that, that cover personal plans and um, uh, pension plans. Okay, uh, we don't have to necessarily go into all seven. Uh, unless you got them off the top of your head, but I definitely want to cover the ones that are big um, yeah. and, and share those with our audience just to, to identify apart from just the regular contribution benefit. What other massive benefits do you get from personal pension plans? Cause I do believe this is a new concept for at least 95% of our audience. Probably higher than that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've been around for 10 years, right? So this is to me, that's old trick. It's an old, old thing, but for a lot of people, this is brand new. And the first reaction to get is exactly what you said is, it's too good to be true. How come no one else told me about this before? And you know what? I, I got so tired of that one day that I started thinking, well, what? how can I explain it to people that something that's novel doesn't necessarily mean it's criminal? Um, the post-it note, you know, paper has been around since the Egyptians. Glue's been around since I think the Assyrians. Why did it take an engineer at 3M eight, 10,000 years to come up with a post-it note? Why didn't someone invent it before that? Does it mean that it was a suspect because no one else had come up with it before that engineer did? I mean, it's just one of those things. It just so happens that it's better. Doesn't mean that it's illegal. Yeah. But anyway, uh, my uh, diatribe of the day aside, um, <laughs> So, yeah, one of the big, big tax deductions of the uh, personal pension plan 
is what we call the buyback of past service. So if think of this, think of it this way. If you uh, have had a corporation, let's say you're, I don't know, a Tim Hortons franchisee, and you've had the franchise for 10 years. And when you started, you start paying yourself a, a modest salary, but now things are picking up. So you're paying yourself higher and higher salaries every year. If you decide to set up a pension plan, you would have the right to retroactively buy back all those years that you are collecting a salary from the Tim Hortons. What I mean by buying back, I mean you'd be increasing the size of the pension that you're allowed to pull out in retirement because you're counting these extra 10 years. And what I mean by counting is we have to calculate what it costs to the pension plan to be so generous. And then we have to fill it with cash. And that cash comes in part from your existing RRSPs. And it also comes from the corporation. And when the corporation, when the Tim Hortons franchise that you own cuts a check to the pension plan, that amount is a brand new corporate tax deduction. Now, just to give you a little bit of uh, an idea of what I'm talking about in terms of dollars and cents, um, the typical buyback of past service corporate tax deduction that we see, uh, depending on how many years, is usually ranging between 50,000 all the way to about $550,000. So this is a, uh, right away at the start, brand new tax deduction that yeah. your corporation can take because you're recognizing the past. So that's so, so just one. so I'm clear, for someone who sets up a brand, this all from day one wouldn't benefit from this, but for someone no, who no. had a professional corporation for the last five, 10 years, that just recognize this, the strategy, they could actually, there's a benefit that's waiting for them today. That's correct. So of course, we're not only speaking to real estate agents, but also to any business owner in Canada yeah. that's had a corporation for a number of years, that benefit could be useful if they used to pull out a salary or if they still take salaries from their corporation. Very good. Very good. Hit me with another, another big one. Yeah, yeah. I'll hit you with, I'll hit you with another one. is called special payments. Now, this is one of my favorites. And to explain why the law allows for these special payments, remember, all of these are tax deductions for your company. So remember March 23rd, 2020, when the stock market, the Toronto Stock Exchange lost 36% in a single day? Yeah. Most, most, most Canadians, I think, that had RRSPs were not in a good mood that day because a th over a third of their wealth had evaporated in a single day. Imagine all those years that you're carefully working, checking your, your portfolio and making calls and this and that. So that was not a good day. But at my company, we were almost ready to celebrate because with our pension plans, you have what's called special payments, meaning you have the ability to top up your pension plan if the assets inside the pension plan aren't growing fast enough. And what do I mean by fast enough? The CRA, there's a regulation in the Income Tax Act that says that our plan is supposed to grow at 7.5%. If you don't hit that target, what's happening is you're developing a deficit inside of your pension plan. Yeah. You're not keeping up with the demand. And if that deficit gets, gets large, we can turn around and ask the government to top it up to replenish the depleted assets with fresh tax deductible contributions from your own corporation. So essentially, so that, is the government is the government picking up the same asset you have, or are they giving it to you in cash? How does that move from the government into the the personal corporation? No, no, no. It's 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 you don't. The government doesn't cut a check. They allow you to take your own money from your own corporation. Pre-tax dollars, so dollars yeah. that haven't been to, taxed So it boosts the contribution limit. It allows boost, you to capitalize at the time when you'd want to purchase more assets to purchase more assets. Well, that's what happened on, on, on March 23rd. Yeah. A lot of our clients, they didn't actually lose 36% because they were prudently invested. They were diversified. So their losses weren't as high. But let's say they lost 10% or 20%. We were able to go back to the government and say, okay, we're going to inject more money and claim even more tax deductions. So it's as if we're manufacturing brand new contribution room. Yeah, yeah. 
I hear, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. That's, and you can do that at any time that the market dips. So that's a huge long-term advantage over the RRSP. Because with the RRSP, if you maxed out and you lost, you lost 36%, there's nothing you can do. You're not allowed to top up. Right. So you're right. Yeah. And so I want to get into here. I want to get into the real estate side. Maybe I'll give you a platform for one more, uh, maybe non real estate benefit. And then I yeah. definitely want to start diving into how this impacts people with a personal real estate portfolio. Yeah. So I'm torn here because there are two that I really I'm itching to talk about. So I'll have to pick one. Um, the, 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 the mother of all tax deductions, the biggest one on record is what we call terminal funding. Okay. So terminal funding uh, is this ability that, again, your corporation has to make a contribution to your pension plan, claim a full write-off on the basis that you decide to take your pension much sooner than the normal retirement age of 65. So let's say you want to switch from collecting a salary to collecting a pension. You're still going to work. You're not truly retired. Yeah. But from a pension perspective, because you stopped taking a salary, and you began taking a pension, you're considered retired. So if you were to do that, let's say, I don't know, at age 55 instead of 65, 10 years sooner, normally the, the pension that's promised to you by the pension plan has to be reduced because there's no way it can afford to pay the same amount of pension 10 years sooner. I mean, you haven't contributed for 10 years, mm -hmm. the money hasn't grown for 10 years, and you're depleting the assets 10 years sooner. Yeah. Something's got to give. So the, the amount of pension is, is really dramatically reduced. So the reason why you have all these penalties is because you started to take money out of the pension plan sooner. But terminal funding can come to the rescue because with the terminal funding rules, what happens is we're allowed to take money from the corporation and contribute it to the pension plan. And that creates a massive tax write-off inside the corporation. And now, because there's so much more money in the pension plan, it can afford to pay you a higher early retirement pension. So your standard of living doesn't go down. Right? So you're replacing. So would you say there's a benefit to earlier retirement within a personal pension plan because of that? Or it's just a, a it's available option? It's available. You don't have to do it. But yeah. if the timing is right, let's say you've had a really, really good year and you've made a couple of million dollars of, uh, of taxable income in your corporation, and you don't want to pay any tax whatsoever, well, you could trigger terminal funding and take that, those millions and dump them into your pension plan because your corporation will take a write-off yeah. and you don't have a tax consequence personally, even though technically it's an employer benefit to you. Yeah. So it's a great way of, of uh, creating massive tax deductions, accelerating tax deductions uh, ahead of time. Okay. All right, guys, we're going to jump into the real estate side here. So tell me more about what happens when you collect rental income, or if you sell real estate that's owned by a personal pension plan. So everyone's assuming you have to buy it in your own name. Obviously, the pension plan has the ability to buy investments, including real estate. So what happens when you collect the rent, when you sell it, what changes in that? Because this is really where the, the magic starts to happen. Well, that's right. Because it's a pension plan, and because the pension plan is tax exempt, when it collects income, like rents, for example, that rental income is tax exempt. There's no tax paid by the pension plan. Same thing if the pension plan as the landlord turns around and sells a property and triggers a large capital gain. That capital gain is not taxable because the pension plan is tax exempt. Yeah. So you can imagine how much faster you can accumulate wealth if you're not taxed along the way, which is what everyone else has to face. But we don't have to face that because our pension plans are tax exempt. So this isn't the first time I'm hearing this. The first time I heard it, my jaw hit the floor. But just to reiterate, guys, income that's generated from a rental property, as well as the equity from selling the property within a pension, personal pension plan is tax exempt, which is a an unbelievable idea and concept. And I think should wake up a lot of our investors if they missed it, um, too bad for you. This is, this is really a, a game changer for a lot, of, a lot of real estate investors. And this could include just 
Um, Jean Pierre, where do you see people applying this? Do they are they buying it on massive buildings? Are they buying it on on smaller multifamilies? Where do you see that play out? Right now, the two areas where we're seeing activity is multi-unit uh, private real estate, like uh, you know those eighteen-story high uh, rental apartment buildings. Yeah, but that seems to be where people like to throw their their, their pension cash. The other one is um, constructing new retirement homes from scratch. I see. So, there you so go. Now, now, yeah. So those are two examples of where uh, pension dollars are going. And you know, this is no this this is not new. Like pension plans have been investing in real estate for decades and decades. I mean, the 407 highway was owned by a pension plan. The uh, Eaton Center was owned by a pension plan. This is not nothing new. It's just that what we've done at Integris is we've used those rules that have been on the books for decades, and we said, why don't we repackage them? So that the little guy in the private sector, you know, the real estate agent, the real estate broker, the doctor, the dentist, the Tim Morgan's franchisee, all those people, why don't they have access to the same rules? Because the law is the law. Yeah. Everybody should have access to it. Now, the little guys aren't necessarily buying an 18-story building. So even though that's where we see it happening, that's just showing you that they're the ones that have identified the strategy. But this can very much be applied to smaller Oh, so, so I should have explained that what our pension plans do is they buy a portion of that, real, of that real estate, of that private real estate. They don't own the entire apartment block by themselves. There are other investors out there, uh, but ours come in and are like co-landlords. Right. Yeah, you're so, doing joint ventures within the personal pension plan. Uh, yeah, merging with, I would assume, other pension plans to other pension buy. Plans and sometimes other investors that are not pension plans. Yeah. So there are, there are different uh, classes of uh, owners that can come in, but um, our pension clients have the ability to buy into private real estate that would not be RSP eligible, for example. Absolutely. Yeah. So is this, given on restrictions here, is this only for Canadian real estate or is this being applied across North America? No, or what? That's the beauty. That's the beauty is that there are no foreign content rules anymore under pension laws. In the old days, um, you had to restrict, you couldn't have more than 30% of your pension money uh, invested outside Canada. But those foreign content rules were scrapped so if you wanted to, you could take your, your pension monies and cross the border and buy private real estate in the United States. And as, as a bonus, as a bonus, when you sell a property in the United States, it would be tax exempt from an American side, from a US side, and from, of course, from the Canadian side, because it's a pension plan. Yeah. So what happens is the uh, US-Canada tax treaty uh, treats these pension plans as superannuation plans, and they are therefore exempt from taxation on both sides of the of the, uh, of the border. Now, let's say you wanted to purchase a pension plan, like within and, and include family members, and and if the parents passed away, how does that kind of maneuver work to protect yeah, the, this the next generation? Right. That's probably the most exciting tax feature of personal pension plans is that when you have family members on the payroll, because remember, you cannot be in a pension plan unless you're employed. So if the family business is employing you and paying you a salary, and they're paying a salary to all the members of the family, then everybody can be in one single plan. And so what happens is this. When mom and dad, let's say mom and dad start the business and the kids join, and mom and dad decide to retire, they start drawing their monthly pension. But then disaster strikes and mom and dad pass away or just mom or dad or whatever. It doesn't have to be both. All the money that was inside the pension plan that was earmarked to pay their pension, that money is now considered pension surplus. It's surplus because there's no one to pay the pension to, right? Um, so because it's surplus, it stays locked inside the pension plan and the survivors, the kids that are also part of the plan, it becomes their money. But it doesn't become automatically their money in the sense that they get a check. It just sits there 
and it's available to fund their pension. Can but you add of, family, their kids down the road? Like you can continue yes. the evolving door. So you can have generational wealth pass through a pension plan and not have yes. equity. Yeah, and what's really cool about this is that you might be familiar with the concept of family trusts. Yes. Okay, well, family trusts have a 21-year dean disposition rule. Mm -hmm. Every 21 years, you have a big tax hit. But because this is a pension trust, the pension plan trust doesn't have the 21-year restriction. So you, cool. could, you could constantly add family members to the family business and then this massive amount of surplus would just keep spreading, growing, tax sheltered, and be available to fund the retirement of future generations. It's huge. Without knowing all of the intricacies, it sounds to me like you'd never want to cash it out. You just want to roll it forward for the sake of your beneficiaries down the road. But I'm sure there's incentives for withdrawal. I, I don't know. I, maybe this is going down a complete rabbit hole. So, But what, what, where I'm struck here is this idea of creating long-term wealth it, apart from doing joint ventures and, and all of this, there aren't families that necessarily can afford significant investments into their personal pension plan. So I'm curious, and this is kind of where we're able to, to co-mingle strategies. How would you help an average family that doesn't currently have a meaningful investment do what you're just describing right now? Yeah. So there are two different ways. Uh, first of all, just, uh, well, we've talked, well, you've talked about the Smith maneuver. So people that have a, a personal residence with the mortgage on it with the HELOC um, would be able to draw from the line of credit to let's say do a shareholder loan to themselves, to their company. That gives the company the cash to start investing in the pension plan. And so now all this growth is gonna happen tax sheltered. So no excuse of not having the cash flow. So that's one, one possible solution. And for those who may have an operating business that doesn't have any money in it because year after year, perhaps on the advice of their accountant, they've tra they transferred the retained earnings to a holding company for credit or protection purposes or just to keep things separate. What, what can you can do is that if the operating company doesn't have the cash flow to set up a pension plan. You can have the holding company lend money to the operating company. It's almost like a mini Smith maneuver, but within your own corporate structure. Right. And the interest that the operating company is paying for the loan yep. is also tax deductible. Right. So you have an ability to create two tax deductions, one for contributing and one for the interest. And what is, and the, the other, not to get too, too technical, but the other advantage of doing it that way is that because we're taking money that's sitting in a highly taxed hold co, because hold co is not subject to the small business 12.2% rate that we were talking about. Right. Tax at a much higher rate because it's passive corporate investing. So if instead of exposing your money to that punitive tax rate, that same money is now growing tax free or tax sheltered inside the pension plan. Yeah. So you have yet another advantage there. So in the same way you'd borrow from one property to invest in another property and you get the deductions, you can borrow it from the hold co as a business and get the deductions, which is the same concept of the Smith maneuver that's applied to your primary residence. That was essentially the, the objective, right? That's right. It's kind of, that's why I said it's kind of our own little Smith maneuver within the corporate world. Yeah, yeah. So if someone's shackled, so you've created this pension plan, are you shackled to that pension plan or can you, how do you get out? What happens if you want to, if you, you're like, I'm, I'm over this, there's now a better opportunity for me elsewhere. Lots, lots of options. Uh, and the good news, especially for your Ontario listeners, is that since December the 8th, 2020, new legislation has been passed in Ontario. And if you set up one of these pension plans, you don't even have to register the, the thing with the, the province. You don't have to fund it if you don't want to. You don't have to lock in the money. So it's not like the traditional pension plan where the money's locked in and you can't touch it. Yeah. You can collapse it. You can get the money out. It's really, really flexible. You can always collapse the plan at any time. It's a simple board resolution from your own company saying, this plan is being wound up. And then you can take the money and do stuff 
with it. Like you can transfer it to an RSP. You can transfer it to a RIF. You could buy an annuity from an insurance company with it. If you wanted to have a, a pension plan, uh, there are all, all kinds of options. So you're not shackled to this structure at all. Yeah. So what I hope this conversation has had and where I hope it's opened our listeners ears, if they've stuck to the end, it probably has, is I, we very much get pigeonholed as consumers into the RSP category. But for many of our listeners who I know are business owners and own multi multifamilies and own many properties, such as, as we do, there's a, a natural benefit um, that can be available to the rich, but really is a, is available to the rich in mind, the people who are aware of what's available to them. Now, so I, I, I like to think that people are now sitting up place saying, okay, you know, I'm sold in the pension plan. And obviously we encourage everyone to do their own research on these things. You guys can reach out to Jean-Pierre uh, at any time to ask questions, but uh, Jean-Pierre, I'm just curious, where do we go from here? So someone's saying, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. I want to get to know more. How can I maybe build my portfolio as a continued growth from here through this personal pension plan? What do they need to do to, to make sure that they're, they're protected? Because obviously there's a lot of legal framework that, that guides how this needs to happen. Yeah, well, being, you should never get into a structure if you don't understand it. So what we always say is take the time to get to know the strategy, learn about it, go on our website, do a little bit of self-study. We even have, offer a course. I mean, you have to pay for that. But if you don't want to do that, just contact us and speak with one of our sales reps and discuss, ask all your questions, get your accountant involved, get your lawyer involved, yep. get them to do the due diligence on your behalf. If you don't have the time or you don't have the appetite for that, that's not a problem. We deal with accountants on a daily basis and we talk to lawyers all the time and we explain it to them because their other clients could benefit from that. So it's not a waste of our time. Um, and then once everybody's got all their questions answered, we can even run some numbers get your historical information about your salary and how much you have in RSP room and all that good stuff we put into our software and it will provide us with those projections I was talking about. It will compare the status quo, which is what 98% of Canadians are doing. And it will pre present what you could have if you upgraded to a pension plan. And if the gap, if the Delta is large enough, then people might say, okay, sign me up. Yeah. Yeah, we're, and I, I anticipate you'll probably get some signups just from from folks that are are getting to know this program here, this this opportunity. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to share this concept. I, I'm sure there's a ton of questions from our listeners. As we get those, um, you guys can share them on YouTube. We will we'll monitor and we'll, we'll keep on the loop and and hopefully connect. But the best way is obviously to to get in touch with Integris and get an idea of what what opportunities are available to you. So you mentioned the website. What's the website that our listeners can find you? Is there any other social platforms that you want um, everyone to, to, to track you down? Well, it's, it's mainly integris-mgt for management.com. That's it. All right. And that's it. If you Google us, we're, I think, number one in the, if you put Integris Pension, we're number one in Google. So uh, no, it shouldn't be hard to find us. Very good. Jean-Pierre, I appreciate you taking the time and uh, I'm sure we'll see you again down the road. Thanks so much. Take care.